Are you willing to do what it takes to become a quantum programmer? If so, it's helpful if you understand some of the underlying concepts of quantum computers before you even begin to start thinking about coding on one. In my previous video, I talked about how coding as we know it is basically a way for humans to write instructions for a computer that can ultimately be translated into the only thing computers understand ones and zeros. There is nothing in between in this digital foundation. Signals are either on or they're off. There's no like kind of on or kind of off. It's a system of binary power signals that is obviously complicated, but it works. I mean, every app you've ever used, whether it's Microsoft Word or Facebook, ultimately is a complicated physical system of binary signals controlled by human programmers. But there's a new kind of computer on the block, and it's not based on anything that is familiar. It's based on the quantum world, which if you've ever learned about quantum mechanics, you know that it's weird to say the very least. The good news is that you can program on one right now for free. People like you and I, regular users, have access to some of the most advanced quantum computers using cloud services from companies like IBM, Rigetti, and D-Wave. But like I said, it's a whole new ballgame. Instead of binary digits or bits, the foundational ones and zeros of the computers we know, quantum computers use quantum binary digits or qubits. On the one hand, a system of bits, a.k.a. a regular computer, a.k.a. a classical computer, is something that you could actually recreate physically. I'm serious. In theory, you could create any classical computer system out there physically using boxes with billiard balls and doors. What I'm saying is that you can make Microsoft Word out of wood. On the flip side of this, you cannot create a quantum computer using physical objects. For one thing, how are you going to make a door that's open and closed at the same time? Let me explain the, the difference that I'm getting at uh, using an analogy. So in the digital world, in this analogy, imagine you have a, a bunch of people playing coin toss. And it's arranged in a tournament hierarchy where heads or tails of one match has an effect on the next match, and so on. The entire hierarchy is based on binary choices, each taking place one after the other. This is how you can think of the digital systems we know. Following this analogy, in the quantum world, each toss in the entire system happens simultaneously, so that you have all of the coins spinning in the air at the same time. It's a superposition of many heads and tails states, all of which are entangled with each other in such a way that the spin of one has an effect on the spin of another. Now, while these are spinning in the air, imagine you have scientists trying to influence these spinning coins to land on heads or tails without knocking them to the ground. And that is the current state of quantum computers. I'm joking, but that's kind of how working with qubits is right now. What makes a qubit a qubit is the ability for it to have superposition, which is, instead of it being heads and tails at the same time, it's a one and a zero at the same time. Why am I bringing all this up? Because if you're going to program these things, you have to actually understand what it's all about. And right now, state-of-the-art quantum computers have dozens of qubits in superposition that are entangled with one another in that the status of one has an effect on the status of another. But we are in the very early days. We are programming the qubits directly, just like how they used to literally program bits directly back in the 1940s. We're at the start of a new era. And boy, is it exciting. And hard. Because managing to keep the relatively small number of qubits in superposition is one of the biggest challenges facing quantum computer scientists today. You have to keep these things in superposition or the whole thing collapses in what is known as decoherence. Uh, basically the coins landing in a definitive heads or tails state, except it's qubits becoming ones or zeros. So even though this is the general concept of quantum computers, there are many different approaches to programming these new systems. 
One of the most popular is the circuit model, in which quantum programs consist of sequences of logic gates. By changing probabilities in various ways using these logic gates, a quantum computer can do math on the qubit while it's in superposition. So quantum programmers make these circuits of logic gates, which can be visually represented, as you can see here. It's a whole new ball game, like I said, and common programming concepts that we're used to, like loops, for example, cannot exist in these systems. With that in mind, if you still want to take that leap forward, the quantum leap forward, fortunately, you have a wealth of resources at your disposal. I mentioned before how you can code on real quantum computers, and you might be thinking to yourself, how am I going to code on a real quantum computer using my digital system if the two are so fundamentally different according to you? Well, the way it works is basically you create the code with a digital high-level programming language, which then gets translated to binary bits, and then it gets translated to qubits. And then basically the process is reversed where it gets translated back to classical bits and ultimately to human text so that you can see the results. There's other ways, though. It's, it is possible to simulate quantum computers on digital hardware in a sort of slow motion version of quantum computing where it pretty much works the same way but at a relative snail's pace. So usually what quantum programmers do is simulate code on digital systems when testing and then they send it off to the real thing when true results are needed. And to do this, there's many different open source projects available. And the two I want to point you towards are Rigetti and Kizkit. I'm going to provide some links in the description for getting started with each of these. But either way, the process for both, generally speaking, is that you write a Python program that specifies your quantum circuit and any additional code. Then you test the Python program using your quantum simulator. From here, you reserve time on a real quantum computer. And then you can actually send and execute your program on the real thing and get your results back on your digital machine. How awesome is that? And what's cool is the quantum programs that you write, even though they'll probably be primitive, you might actually be able to help push the industry forward. Yeah, you could have an impact and help bring the future a little bit closer to us and a little bit quicker. Thanks for watching this video today. I hope you enjoyed it. I imagine I'll do more videos on quantum computers in the future, so feel free to subscribe if you're interested. And other than that, have a good one.